The other thing going on in the tech bro space that I didn't bring up um, with y'all earlier is how much work there is for in the quest for immortality. Just like now, that, we now, got episode amazing. 201. Episode, this is not 201, it's 198. Just make sure. One. Just clarify. 198 of 8 to this show. Bro. Yeah. We've had a lot of if legendary people. This was episode 200, on. it's 200. Yeah. It's 201, 201. We lost count when we hit triple digits. We lost count. Uh, I'm sorry. Right? Uh, <laughs> welcome on the show, Thank Elise. You. Elise, who welcome. let the world know who you are, what you do. Bam. Woo. Hey everybody, Uh, my name is Elise. I am the host of TED Talks Daily, which is the flagship podcast from TED, the speaker series. It's downloaded a million times a day around the world. So hopefully you are already listening. And if not, you can subscribe wherever you listen to podcasts. Subscribe in the description below. Make sure to subscribe to us. Host also. at large at yeah. NPR, National Public Radio, which NPR, is not in the States, is sort of like the BBC, but in the US. And um, I'm a correspondent for Vice, Vice Television, mm. which does a daily newscast called Vice News Tonight, which uh, I file Amazing. stories for sometimes. Amazing. Cool. Well, so that's a lot of different things. A lo- yeah, a go. lot of different things. And we're here to I talk wanna about. Tell, I want to share about how I, how I found out about you, Elise. I was watching oh, cool. your show. Future You by Elise You. <laughs> yeah, Future and You with Elise You, right? It rhymes. <laughs> there you go. Yeah, <laughs> amazing. It works. And yeah, and that's um, I I just love looking at like you were ahead of most of us. Like now we know a lot about like, um, like brain like computer interface technology yeah. and brain computer interface. And now Neuralink is kind of out. But when you were covering these stories, I remember watching these videos. I'm like, there's nothing like this. Right. Um, yeah. Can you share with us what was one of the like most mind blowing things you find out? on that show? Yeah, I mean, so I did this web series called Future You with Elise Hugh, and it really explored kind of the future of the human body, how we're gonna become, we're gonna be able to lengthen our lives and become super intelligent and have better memories and all these things simply by zapping our brains um, in the right places, right? And so what I think is I'm really, something that I'm really (laughs) like find promising um, is the advances to memory, right? And learning. Because for one of the last episodes, I got hooked up to um, a brain stimulation system. Um, It's called, I'm trying to remember, it's called like transcranial uh, current stimulation or something like that. I'm I'm, I'm kind of botching this um, this, uh, acronym, but what you do is when you're connected and you're sleeping, what they can watch, they can, it's two ways, right? So they can monitor when you fall into deep sleep. And when they fall into deep sleep, what they do is they sort of like stimulate your brain while it's doing the deep sleep, um, during the deep sleep part of the um, evening. And it helps bake in the memories of what you experienced right before so that you're essentially sharper in the morning. Wow. Which holds all sorts of different promise for treating disease. You know, so if you have mental illness, you have addiction, you could treat it in one uh, different ways with this sort of uh, stimulating your brain. But then also, um, if you want to learn a new language, if you want to learn new skills, so if it's a physical thing, um, piano, something like that, that's repetitive, you could stimulate your motor cortex. If it's deeper memory for language learning, you could stimulate um, the part of your brain that's responsible for that. So. I thought that was really promising, especially I mean, for treating disease. <laughs> that changes everything. It I changes everything so. on how we live it does, our lives. That does change yeah. everything. I mean, here's where I come into play, right? <laughs> here's, here's where I come into play. Right. I'm very sketched and sussed out about this <laughs> computer, right. yeah. human. computer brain interface. That's yeah, the wildest like, thing. It, it is the brain. wildest thing. We, yeah. for thousands, hundreds and thousands of years, have, you know, been on our own now all of a sudden and our last what 0.001 percent of our lifespans we need a computer to better our lives it's kind of i don't know it puts me on a, a little bit of a conspiracy edge i'll say oh wow my oh. response the re- most common response when i asked a lot of neuroscientists that is they would say well don't you use a cell phone 
But Which is that, to say, we are already <laughs> changing our brains. We're already right. changing the way our attention spans. We're already changing kind of what we need to remember and what we don't uh, need to remember. For example, you know, I used to remember phone numbers when I was a child, right? Because you had to dial right. phone numbers. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That never happens anymore. Remember? Um, we now <laughs> pick up our phones days. at least like 85 times a day out of our pockets. That is a change in our brain because we have, we have right. now been... Um, hmm so conditioned by the little slot machines in our pockets, right? So our brains are already changed and changing by technology. This just is, seems a little scarier because in some cases it, it requires an implant, right? Neuralink right. Um, sometimes are implanted devices in our mm -hmm. brains. But um, if you think about it, our, our devices have been getting closer and closer to our bodies and our hearts and our minds as it is. So it sort of just opens up um, I, I just think it's important that we ask ethical and moral questions like you're asking, um, right. but in a lot of ways, we're already changed. 200-ish <laughs> episodes in, and I'm finally <laughs> proud to say, at least you're the first one to actually convince me and checkmate me in an argument. Well done. <laughs> I have to give it to you. That's amazing. Really, Wait, really at least this is what I want to know. Woo! So when you started this, you started this show, your main question was always like, in 2050, what's the technology going to be like? Yeah. Um, do you think this is going to come sooner than 2050? You think all the changes you looked at, or you think yes. it's, um, oh, all right. I think, yeah, I think the therapeutic devices will right. already come sooner. Um, the first, right. one of the first episodes that we shot was one on exoskeletons that helps okay. paralyze people walk again, right? Okay. Because it's not as if your, your brain sort of telling your leg to walk has ever stopped, even if you're, um, even if you don't have legs. Mm -hmm. And so what they are able to do is sort of intercept that brain signal telling your leg um, to move and send that brain signal to an external True. device, Phantom which is, limb syndrome. You know, it's, mechanical it's legs, mechanical legs, right? Yeah. So, so right. if you are in a robot skeleton, an exoskeleton, and um, fitted for it, it's really helping people who can't par paralyze people who can't walk anymore, walk again, because the the brain signal is still there. And so that's amazing. So I think mm. those therapeutic devices using exoskeletons um, are already here. It's just prohibitively expensive. And so they need to come out of the research world into the commercial space, the private sector, right. um, that, and ideally the government sector so that it can be more equally distributed <laughs> across populations that can need, who, who need it. I mean, depending on your government, right? right? But yeah. um, Wow. Wah, wah. So I mean, um, I mean, wow, wow, right? I mean, different countries will have access to these things earlier than other countries, and then will give so many different, you know, disadvantages, privileges, and priorities, privileges, right? Right. I mean, and we're I mean, seeing this with the vaccine right now. What do you mean? <laughs> I am guessing. I mean, so in the U.S. <laughs> right now we bro. have we have a coronavirus vaccine that okay. is beginning to get distributed, and it's supposed to go first to the most essential sort of frontline workers, like healthcare mm, professionals, medical staff, and then people medical staff, people in right. nursing homes, any exactly. uh, people in prisons, institutionalized people, because um, we know that coronavirus spreads most virulently in those populations. However, I am going to guess, and I know that I'm a skeptical journalist, but I'm going to guess that the NBA, you know, the Nas National Basketball right. Association, and then the NFL, the National Football League, they're going to be able to get those vaccines. Yeah, early. definitely. Before they're going to get have... to cut in line. Yep, pretty right. much. And not just that, you got the world leaders who are now also very, you know, instead of quarantining in palaces, they are going to go take those vaccines first, and they're going to get it first. It's obvious. Like, I can't not say this, but then right. again, kind of can't, so... But okay. it's crazy. It's crazy how there's preferential treatment mm. when it's in the Hippocratic Oath that no one gets preferential treatment and all that shit. Wow. <laughs> and now it's like, do we have right, morals true. anymore? I don't know. Right. I mean, <laughs> oh, no. Yeah, I know. we're about to go into a deep, deep path with me they, today. They say, they say that everyone will get it. They say everyone will get these technologies and everyone will get access to these things. But I'm yes, kind eventually, of yes. Like, there's going to be yeah. mass vaccine programs. Um, and I right. think that my hope is that by September of 2021, that most of the world will have found uh, a vaccine will have found a way to most of the world or enough of the population of the world such that coronavirus is not um, drastically, fundamentally altering life and then killing the hundreds of thousands of people who have already died from it. So, yeah, you know, it's only a matter of time before the virus actually changes how it looks and then the vaccine will become very obsolete, right? Like, it's just... What? <laughs> yeah. No, literally. Right, there's different strains of the virus. So that's yeah. the thing. It's like, mm -hmm. you know, if 
Yeah. I mean, I have done, I'm not a scientist. And so don't, don't to catch right. me lying, as we say in Texas, mm-hmm. which is the state where I'm from, but, um, mm-hmm. you know, these viruses can mutate and that's the biggest concern, right? Or there's a new, <laughs> there's some new animal born disease that then ravages hum- humanity right. as we know, yep. right? Like this one yeah. was from pangolins or from bats, you know, like there's other stuff it's, that's carried in, it's a carried hybrid. in skunks or minks or whatever. So but yeah no it's true this uh, like you that's that's like one percent of the information that's out mm. there about all this change and drift and shift and drift and all that stuff but it's scary nevertheless medical science is very scary it's sca- it's, i'm just so confused yeah it is very scary medical you're confused science. i do this for um I'm the- <laughs> <laughs> well i feel like covid the one thing with covid is that i feel like all these technologies accelerated so far i mean your link came out this year I mean, elon musk unveiled it and I feel like now all the tech people are really working, doubling down since they can't go outside, whatever. So- the other thing going on in the tech bro space that I didn't bring up um, with y'all earlier is how much work there is for in the quest for immortality, for living longer and longevity. It's I'm against this. Wild. I'm against this big time. <laughs> right. Like I hate oh, the wow. fact that we humans are searching for something that's, let's face it, it's not going to happen because we die at a molecular level. So you got to stop that before you stop at a macro mm. molecular level of that. I'm, I'm a very hippie kind of medical student where I'm just like, you know, let the world live and die is how it works. Circle of life. Right. I watched the Lion King. You guys, well, when, the Lion King. Yeah. I know, I know, but we're, we're all about preserving life now, preserving yeah, as much why? life as we can for as long as dude i don't know that's how people are reacting with covid and everything this is the main priority right now but why why try to preserve life as a whole it's it's good to embrace these dark moments in human history where people live and then they die it's the one thing that's promised to me you are amazing guest for the day anyone who's watching this (laughs) promise the day we were born. okay so why do people want to live forever at least why do you think people want to live forever Because I think we now live in a time, humanity has come through the time of constant war, right? Constant disease and plague. Um, Obviously we're in the middle of a grand pandemic right now, but for for so much of human civilization, plagues were very normal, constant war was very normal. So survival um, was hacked enough by the 21st century, which we now find ourselves in. My yeah. theory is that we, we, have sur- we have hacked survival. You know, the thing that was killing us in, in droves and in millions. Um, we have hacked survival by the time, I guess the end of World War II, right? And so we've mm-hmm. been living in this very um, p- prosperous time f- for the last 75, 80 years. And as a result, what we're doing with human ingenuity and innovation and working together is now trying to become more and more godlike. You know, and what what does it mean to be godlike? <laughs> right? It would be to hack ourselves, you mm-hmm. know, to be more godlike, like with all this brain computer interface, for example, um, to be smarter, faster, better, stronger. So those all are all knowing, sorts of hacks, omni- right? To become all knowing, to become omniscient, om- omnipresent, all those things but then also to hack ourselves to achieve ultimate bliss, right? Because we're so lucky. We have so few problems of survival mm-hmm. that we can try and become more blissful. Like we've already achieved the sort of humanist or liberal dream of ending war and ending strife and ending um, constant disease. Mm-hmm. So now I think hum- humanity is trying or the elites are trying to um, achieve the attributes of what it would be to be a God, right? Which would be to live forever, immortality. Mm -hmm. And it totally makes sense that we've gone that way, but um, I do think it's important to, because (laughs) what else, in terms of like, if you are so comfortable, Mm -hmm. right? If you are so comfortable and you have so many tools at your hand, at at your disposal, and those tools have had the power of say the internet, you know, like these technologies that have drastically um, change the way we connect with one another, what we understand of knowledge, you know, in general and um, how we live our lives. What else are you gonna do, right? Like you're gonna continue try, trying to up the ante and up the ante and up the ante. And we are already at this place where we're trying to become sort of like homo deus, right? The idea of um, <laughs> transcending homo sapiens yes. and becoming 
gods. Man and, god. And, <laughs> right, man god. Right, man god. And it's it's wild. <laughs> oh and no. I don't think we think least, about it enough. And it's coming closer than we think it is, right? Or Yeah. Do you yeah, think you you think you'd live forever at least? Like you're smart and you research this a lot. Do you know? I don't want to. I mean, I'm a pretty simple gal. That's a good question, but I'm a simple gal. Right. And like, mm -hmm. I just want to be as content. I, I think I've really leaned in, especially at this stay at home year that we've all lived in. I think I've really leaned in on the um, idea of stoicism and just Which like is... being totally, totally present in the moment and per totally just like, this is my favorite moment. You guys can ask me like, what was your best memory? No, no, no. Like, this is my favorite hey, moment. The, the one with you. There's the no idea moment. of a past. There's no idea of a future. Yeah, right? So <laughs> let's do it. <laughs> so just to sort of accept kind of the human condition and just like deep sort of acceptance, I think is where I'm, where I've landed mm -hmm. and, um, and like contentment there. Mm -hmm. And so when I die, I will like, I'm, I don't want to fight death because it seems like that you're putting the, these folks are putting a lot of effort into hacking it and optimizing, you know, the whole tech language is always optimization right and optimizing everything <laughs> optimizing and Listen, I, think I don't mean to be a bummer but i really like i i don't really believe in immortality as an option for human beings i don't know if this is the religious side of me or mm -hmm. if this is just the skeptical side but i just think it's 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 possible like and i don't think yeah to be fair i just want to like kind of pull back the discussion i don't mm -hmm. think that immortality is the ultimate goal i think it's living a longer life like into your 120 150 and to have more quality years right mm -hmm. and that gets that's kind of pushing the edge right that's like really you want to you want to know what's radical. scary okay i've mentioned this a lot on the show right everyone by now should know what i study so i do i do medicine and surgery right me going into this I thought this was my quest for finding immortality. You know, it's all about preventing death. Right. And, you know, being the hero and all that stuff. But it turned out medicine as a whole is a scam. I'm sorry. <laughs> I agree. I'm glad you said it, it really <laughs> is. Here's why. The only thing they teach us is, okay, so this is what happens when a cell goes bad. The only thing you can do is just make it go bad, but for a longer period. And that way you don't die. Right. Mm -hmm. So that changed my whole theory and goal around medicine. Instead of preventing death, my hopes with studying this is to improve the quality of life rather than the quantity of life. You but what, what if I you're mean? doing both? So D Dr. David Sinclair, there was an episode of Dave, um, Future You with Elise Hugh about mm -hmm. the quest for to reverse aging. And Dr. David Sinclair, who is a pretty well-known geneticist at Harvard Medical School, what he's been able to do is to really study sirtuins, which are like emergency responders inside our cells that then help the cells repair themselves. Because what his whole theory on aging is, is that as we age, our, when our cells are duplicating, you know, our cells are constantly have to, having to duplicate, right? Mm -hmm. They're making poorer and poorer copies. So like, it's like back in the old days of CDs, when you're copying CDs over and over and over again, there's CD degradation. And that's yeah. what happens as we're getting older. And that's what's responsible for our joints hurting and our hair turning gray and getting wrinkles and all these things. So he's like, okay, what if I hack that process? What if I um, sent in these sirtuins and these sirtuins inside these cells could help cells make cleaner copies. And so they're, they're not, there's not the degradation that comes as cells are, um, the cells are, um, you know, uh, duplicating themselves as they're multiplying. Mm -hmm. And as a result, um, and now there's supplements for it so that what it's doing the same thing as exercise. So they say like, Hey, you should exercise 45 minutes a day, five times a week or whatever it is. And why, why are there benefits of that exercise? Because what it does is it jumpstarts the sirtuins that keeps the cells hmm. from um, multiplying poorly. Wow. Instead, wow. Um, <laughs> copying cleanly. Okay. And so now yeah. there is a new supplement cool. um, that would do that. And so in this episode, I actually uh, do a whole regimen that includes exercise, that includes cutting out sugar to try and reverse my, um, biological age so you know they can get some age markers from you based on right. your um, blood and your habits and your diet and all these things and uh it was a really interesting experiment but that's that's essentially what you're talking about Ali like with the cells right because um if there is a way to prevent cell degradation then ideally we could live longer 
The moral question is, should humans be living longer? Should we be taking more resources on this planet? longer and then should we be should politicians be staying in their jobs and not retiring and like keeping those old ideas in place until they're 120 because they're not dying anymore yeah, right i want to move <laughs> right now the what do you mean questions? to 120 <laughs> yeah imagine like, i want to move right? right now you're talking wow. about 120 years like nah gee Mind that ain't for yeah me. yeah at least so yeah check it out like google I, future you with elise hugh on aging and then check it out listeners. we'll put a link to that in the description too we'll check it out but you can buy you'll find a link link here or there mm-hmm. at least i want to know what what drives you like what why makes you want to like you've met so many people you keep talking about all these different things i yeah. do the ted talks uh, the yeah i'm totally a curious person a lot of journalism okay. i think um a couple different what things are you looking for? <laughs> one is i'm totally cu- okay. i'm a curious person so ever since i was a little kid um like one question would lead to more questions and then i want to learn i i have this general hunger to expand my understanding of things um but not just kind of like in books, right? I'm also somebody who really loves people. I get a lot of energy from people. Um, I love finding out what makes people tick. I, I think you can tell that I'm very enthusiastic about getting to know whether it's strangers or deepening my relationships with people that I already um, know. Like I love people. And so being a journalist is perfect, right? Because I'm constantly getting to be exposed to two things that really drive me. One, new ideas and stuff that like makes me think, right? Okay. And also two, new people. And so I collect friends, I collect ideas, um, and there isn't really a subject that bores me. There's a lot of subjects that sort of excite me more, like thinking about the future, like thinking about possibility. Um, with TED, uh, there is a TED talk basically on every topic, we say from AI all the way to zoology, right? So um, that's been right. really fun because I'm exposed to a lot of things that I may not be that naturally curious about like I don't understand physics I've never really taken physics and so mm. so so that area you is just some physics you can watch our show with the more Abbas is uh, linking up yes okay Bro, Link that this too. episode's exactly. description that. is gonna be the longest one yet watch we'll do it. <laughs> we'll do it. that's amazing yeah do you, yeah so, so yeah do you have any those are the two things for curiosity us, advice uh, do you have any advice for us we're young yeah. we're young podcasters we've been doing this 200 episodes now we're meeting we, people from all around the world yeah i think where we right. don't but what i don't think we come to like as close of a curiosity as you do so how could you encourage people of our age or younger to actually seek curiosity explore mm-hmm. you know get lost in the world of different sciences and arts and talents and what advice can you give people of our age? i think yeah, I think that's great. I, one thing that um, one thing that I think has really helped me is to find people that I really admire, like my mentors, um, or find people that you admire who you may not have ever had any contact with and reach out. Like there's nothing quite like a cold email. I think y'all know that, right? Like a cold email or a cold DM to try and connect with people that you really want to talk to. Yeah. And uh, most of the time, I would say like more often than not, they're like, yeah, sure. Sure, I'll give you some of my time. Um, It helps to kind of have a a specific ask, but what sparks curiosity for me is the idea of collision. Mm -hmm. Um, It sparks curiosity and it sparks creativity. I always come up with new ideas and then think different ways when I collide or when I, what I mean by collide is like come into contact with somebody who I might not have otherwise talked to. And so for those of y'all out there who are podcasting, who are just students, or who just kind of like want to experience the world in more color, I would say if there are people who inspire you, reach out to them and um, see if you can have a conversation or be very specific with your ask. I know Tim Tim Ferriss, who's a big podcaster in the US, like he talks about people reach out to him all the time, but the things, the people that he gets back to are the ones who have very, very specific questions or have clearly mm. like listened to a lot of episodes and then wanted to know something or wanted to like get his time. Because, you know, a lot of us are really busy and then we have families right. and all these things, but I'm always happy to like um, give my time to something that seems like where the other side kind of did their homework, you know? So I think mm. that's helpful. Obviously, I think travel and getting out of your comfort whatever zone. sort of pod you're in, your comfort zone is so crucial. It has broken down so much of my natural or my fear, you know, um, fear-based judgment. So I think there's nothing, like when I was little, there were a lot of things that would weird me out. 
um, just because I had never really experienced it before. I'd never, like, this could be something as simple as food, but it could be um, people living in a different way, right? Like right. people will take off their shoes in Korea, like when they enter homes, even the maintenance guys, that would mm -hmm. be mind boggling to most of the West. Um, and so all these, I, I think just experiencing different cultures and colliding with people who are very different than you also then sparks a lot of creativity, but then also it gets rid of judgment. It gets rid of bias. It gets rid of a lot of prejudice that I think is really harmful right. to, mm -hmm. to right. us in the world. So just a couple There's, big picture yeah. ideas. All right, I, I mean, want to flip this cool. over right now. Uh, <laughs> yeah. I want to I want to know what scares from all the stuff you've seen, right, to do with medical sciences and different types of science. What scares you the most? What scares me is that like we are going to trust more and more um, machine learning and AI going mm -hmm. forward to make a lot of our decisions for us or to automate a lot of things, whether that's getting a loan, you know, like who gets to get a loan or um, just sorting people. Uh, like customs and immigration <laughs> enforcement, I think AI is going to become more and more common there or deciding like who's criminal or who's who's at risk in, in a population, right. um, who's at risk at school, like in education settings. A lot of our institutions are more and more going to rely on uh, machine learning because machine learning for the most part works pretty effectively. Like if you go into your Google photos and you enter like cat to search for any photo with a cat, it's pretty good at recognizing all the photos where a cat has showed up because it has analyzed millions upon millions and upon millions of cat images, right? Um, such that it knows and it's learned. But what we do is in making AI and trusting um, AI is that we're introducing a lot of our human biases into the machine. Right. And so right. my fear uh -huh. is that <laughs> in the next like, like yes. 10 years when everything becomes automated, that that which like that that which makes society already so um, problematic for the marginalized communities, marginalized mm -hmm. religions, marginalized um, races, like is going to be worse. Way worse. <laughs> um, yeah. Right. Because this, the people who the are programming aren't right. considering the effects um, of large scale machine uh -huh. yeah, optimization. How to optimize? How to optimize? But. It leaves people out. There's still edge cases, right? And like, what are we doing for the edge cases? That's something that I think we really have to think about. We really, really. Do. So, what is? Do you have any? Like, so you think about this? Do you have any solutions to this? Like, I mean, AI is gonna end up taking being control everywhere. I mean, I, so I. How do we? How do we live our life in a way that it doesn't ruin our life? Yeah, I mean, for the most part, we trust it. I think that, like, already, mm -hmm. you know, I like. Right maps you know getting us places right. like you you use your smart virtual personal assistant so whether that's amazon's alexa or google google voice or whatever we trust that these devices already my problem my my whole warning about technology i i, I embrace it i think it's for the most part been very helpful my whole warning about technology is that we need to be asking the questions about it on the front end and not after it's already changed us. True. So now we're like coming out with all these like Netflix documentaries about social platforms, right? right. Like Twitter and Facebook and how awful they are. And they're, <laughs> they're making us these vain people and these attention seeking and like it's ruined our elections and democracies around the world are toppling and favoring <laughs> extremism and aut autocrats. And, and there is an argument to be made that these platforms have really accelerated that because the internet, like the social internet, the right. social web really um, rewards bullies. It rewards extreme positions and emotional positions. That's how but we up. finally understand that now, <laughs> yeah. 15 years after the cat's already been out of the bag, right? Like we're having Pretty these much. conversations now instead of before. And so part of the, my motivation in doing Future You with Elise Hugh mm -hmm. was that very idea, like, Brain computer interface is going to be a thing that's going to be just so normalized in our lives 15 years from now or in our societies in some in com com capacity. But have we asked, like, should we be living an extra 20 years? Should we be enhancing ourselves these way this way? Should we, like, essentially be able to, it's like doping, right? In some ways, it's like doping for right, our brain. It is. Like, who gets it? Who doesn't get it? Like, what parts of society are going to be included? What parts aren't going to be? Who gets things first? So these are a lot of really important ethical questions that we need to be asking ourselves. And we don't. We often don't until it's too late. And so Pretty I'm glad much. I have the chance to talk about it with you guys now. Um, yeah. And for any listeners out there. Uh, I'm, glad, I'm really glad we talked about this yeah. too. 
because I think it's a huge thing that not too many people are aware of. It's just happening. It's just coming. People are worried about all the like other trivial things. And the, one of the biggest like things they're going to face all of humanity is this artificial intelligence, whatever, genetic engineering. We haven't have, we haven't even talked about that. Right. Bio -packing, so have right babies, exactly. yeah. I can live for every, <laughs> right. Yeah. You guys have yeah. seen Gattaca, right? Wow. It still holds up that movie Gattaca from the nineties. It's no. with Uma Thurman yeah. and uh, Ethan Hawke and Jude Law is in there. It's really good. So let me just put Gattaca. Okay. He's the one with out. the movies. I, I I don't I don't got nothing right, to do with recommendation. Movies. Yeah, I'm the one so, who watches. That's on you. <laughs> that's but, there you go. But yeah, I'll check it out. Gattaca, right? More AI movies are coming real. Our life is gonna become. But it's funny because you know AI right movies. Now. Like I could think of AI movies right now, and I, like the top one I get is you know anything to do with Will Smith. I Robot. <laughs> exactly. See, like yeah, exactly. This, this wasn't even planned. <laughs> we thought this wasn't even, like literally anything to do with that's Will so Smith. That's so funny. But literally, right. they all, like they Time actually legend. all. Mm -hmm. They're same leading premise, right. Right. It's always one of the, the premise. Like one of the things I'm crazy. One of the things I'm worried about, at least for at least as a podcaster, is AI controlling speech and censorship of speech on platforms. Um, we've had different journalists come on and like explain how they've been like shadow banned of different YouTube and other algorithms just because an AI struck them down immediately before. So I don't know. So you've you've I know you're you're like you can talk about different things. Have you ever faced censorship or um, do you have any advice for us? I lived, I lived in okay. a, I lived in South Korea, which has a national security law that <laughs> dates back to anti-communism, like dates back to the 1960s. And that was pretty ridiculous. Like the internet wasn't completely free in a country where the internet is the fastest in the world. In the world, yeah. Yeah. And so <laughs> it was really wild. There were things like you can't look up certain things about North Korea. You can't access North Korean news or North Korean sites because of like this old, right. old, old vestige of the Cold War. Um, Damn. also, you know, like you can't go to Pornhub, definitely can't go to Pornhub, even to read <laughs> the data blogs, that's, that's, you know, like <laughs> from, from, so there was something that I really right loved there. on Pornhub, um, <laughs> called yep. the data blog. Uh, and, the data and blog? The da so they had, so Pornhub would keep like, it has a lot of metrics, right? And it would keep it's like Facebook. Like, <laughs> these really fascinating metrics on like what people were searching for each month or like whether their, tra when their traffic would die down. So they would have like graphs, for example, when the Super Bowl, when the American Super Bowl happened, the, the uh, US football, you know, like, and, and the, the spikes of, they would have these charts where it was like, oh, the time spent on site no would just watching anything. Would like dip out. But then during yeah, halftime, for example, it would dip back up. Cause you had like, or like you would spike back up, you know, because um, there was a 30 minute break, you know? Remember the I DVD people, when I said that, I didn't that have separate, a wave. And this from this, that it's was- It's so great. Yeah, All so right, like so... I used to love that blog, for example, and I discovered <laughs> in South Korea that it was banned. And so, oh, I see. Yeah, so well, it's also banned okay. in you know Arabic countries. Too, <laughs> like Arabic countries. Where I'm this living day. in now. Mm. Deep briefing. I said anything that separates this from this. All right. I know. Now. I had to get. I had to go there because you kind of dared me to. I, so right. I didn't really say shit. Censorship. I, I didn't dare talking? anything. Like no, that was me. The, that was no. that one. I know, but from the outset, you were essentially True. saying like, oh yes, I live in this Arabic country and, and, and so I kind of, you know, I like to, I like to subvert the rules sometimes. And so True. I was like, right. oh, well, this is a really good example of censorship. I mean, listen, I, <laughs> there I you go. Just to stay <laughs> alive, let's put it like that. Uh, hmm. Okay. But yeah, sure. I guess so. Like there's a right. lot of other websites we could have said like, I don't know, Facebook or... <laughs> Facebook, but it's Instagram. not banned. That's not banned in South Korea. Banned. Okay, China, but... the China, the Chinese firewall is really strong. I mean, you know? Great Wall of really? China, Great Wall of Chinese firewall. I mean, it kind of makes yeah, sense. Wow. Right there, the, right? the Great oh Firewall God. of China. Yeah, Great that, Firewall yes, of China. That, that could be an mean... episode on the future. You with at least you, at least you. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> firewall of China. China. Dude, wait. I, do you do you know? So I I always hear that in China things are censored. People can't get like. It's really bad. But you've been there, right? So do you know? how yeah. what are we talking about here so um every so american american platforms you know platforms that came out of american tech companies facebook twitter instagram google. literally um google. google because of competitive reasons google has no market share in china almost no market share in china um so it's searching bad. a lot of terms you cannot search for instance tiananmen square tiananmen square massacre the date of it um 
there's a lot of things there there was one I was there kind of in the early aughts like 2006 or 2007 when Taiwan which China contends is theirs you know that they consider it a renegade province when but Taiwan is actually like a full-fledged democracy of what 24 to 26 million people and they had built like the second highest building in the world and in China you couldn't see photos of it or find out about it because just because of like machismo because of like competition reasons, you can see you know, it like, <laughs> with your own eyes but you can't and yeah can't like you maybe. can't yeah it didn't wow. exist on the Chinese internet and so really it has to do with history um and uh, it's a nationalistic drive, which I'm sure, you know, any country, any of y'all who are in sort of nationalistic countries understand. Um, but the Chinese firewall is powered by so many millions of young sensors who like immediately see things and kill it, kill it, like just at the root that it's just amazing. It's unparalleled in the world. Now you can't search Uyghurs and what's happening to people in the Xinjiang province. Um, right. Where, right. where China is essentially wow. like overseeing mass. We did an episode on that also. We did, yeah, we did the two part we, uh, right. podcast documentary kind of thing. With doc, we with experimented Jihar. with those she, kind of she podcasts. Couldn't, she, couldn't, she couldn't even like tell say this stuff in China. So she had to come to the US and she's trying to, and they can't even like, if she tried to say something to us, she's afraid of her family. Back home. Then get, yeah, I mean, home. we have evidence that yeah. they're harvesting hair. They might be harvesting Ooh. organs. It's really, okay. really next level sort of dystopia stuff. What's happening yeah. to the Uyghurs? It's, it's awful. I don't think awful. it's and the America, the international community has not stood up against this strong enough at all. It's not a dystopia. I think of it more as a drone civilization kind of uh, thing, where they all are forced to think, eat, dress, look the same, and it's just, it's crazy. Okay. Because I like it's just stupid how. No, I'm, I don't want to say it's stupid, but it really is. It's just stupid how it's operating and what they're doing. Like It's evil how it's turned a blind it's eye. It's evil, yeah. Do you, do you have, I don't know if you can share, but do you have any thoughts on like why the international community has not, <laughs> like this is, we've, we've covered it. This is like, we're talking about millions and millions of people locked up in camps. Um, yeah, because why, often I read, I read this really great, thought it was like a tweet or something that's that said you know human rights and peace are often uh -huh. on opposite sides of a spectrum so like in when we pres when we value human rights in ca in this case of the Uyghurs then what that means is we're going to have to come into conflict with China right so then that that so in order to value peace right. then we have to turn a blind eye to human rights right? so like diplomacy right. means having to place these ideas human rights versus peace at like opposite ends at polar opposites instead of trying to do both right to wow. for it to be a both and and so i think that's one of the problems right all of these countries most of them that have like economic interests and economic ties to china know that they don't want to get into a fight with china over the fact that they're systematically killing an entire population of people right an, an entire minority group um and, and exploiting them right uh but right. But in the interest of trying to maintain trade relations and maintain, you know, good relations on the climate, right? So like the U.S. is in this terrible spot, and now the U.S. and China are more are edging closer to just open, open battle, right? Open Cold oh, War. Wow. But um, but U.S. is in this spot where we really do want Chinese cooperation on things like climate change. We need chi like China needs to right. be a huge player in reducing emissions, right? But then to get China, so how important is protecting the Uyghurs? <laughs> Right. when we want them to just re reduce emissions. So everything is like, we want to oh, balance wow. our interest for peace, but then it comes into conflict with human rights. And so that's one way I would explain it um, and why that's it's brilliant. so, I haven't thought of it so like that. challenging. Mm. Yeah. It sucks. Oh, wow. my, my father is a Chinese defector. He was sent to a re-education camp, you know, in the 1960s during um, uh, Mao Zedong, you know, and the, uh, cultural revolution where they were burning books and burning CDs and all of these things and like killing killing the intellectuals. And uh, my father actually had to swim, swim for hours and hours to freedom in um, Hong Kong, which was then British. And so I, I know it, it has touched my life, you know, this kind of um, subjugation <laughs> mm -hmm. of Chinese people, because the Uyghurs are, uh, they are rightfully living in China. They've always been in, in China, right. but they, they're not Han Chinese. Like not everybody needs to be Han Chinese, but they're being right. um, 
they're, they're getting re-educated into that, right? Yeah. And so it's pretty, pretty. But you see that that whole issue wow. right there. Now imagine giving them the whole like ability to take the medical science aspect of things that we discussed earlier on in the episodes, and now and they, they integrate it in a way where it benefits the government. Right. right. See, that's what's scary about who gets this Anything. technology right. and who doesn't. Right. Right? Such a good point. Because because now it's like, okay, well, they're already doing all this tactics and they're doing it the brute force way. Imagine if we give them a shortcut way of, you know, putting a bunch of electrodes on their foreheads and they wake up already, you know, all hail the China's government or right. whatever. We are doing. now, yeah, we are now developing godlike powers. Mm. But who gets godlike powers? It's exactly. to be governments and corporations. People who, you and know, that, are funding the- You want that? <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Elise. <laughs> but and with that, uh, with that mic drop, I guess I'll bid you guys farewell. I mean, sure. Elise, I, thank I, you so much, honestly. <laughs> and for sharing, I just want to know what's in the future for you, Elise. So, yeah. Uh, today, I think I'm going to have a pretty big lunch. No, um, <laughs> what's in the future? I'm, I'm, on, I'm in lockdown for at least the next month, but in, in 2021, I will be writing a book about my time in Korea, focusing on K-beauty, um, which is kind of a huge trend around the world, and Korean women and what, what, how they are sort of um, symbolic of uh, the quest for beauty globally. Right. So I think it's going to be wow. really interesting. I'm going to be spending time on my book next year, I hope, if I can get motivated again. That's amazing. Um, but I'll still be hosting TED. I agree. So that, can... that sounds right. Uh, Tokyo, you I, I don't know if you saw Amazing. You, Tokyo, Tokyo Idol. I don't know if you saw that documentary on Netflix. It's about little girls that are like idolized as um, like Tokyo Idols. <laughs> and then these grown men come and they just, well, uh, it's a very weird relationship they have. And yeah, and it's very interesting, like Wild. this topic. Yeah. Wow. Well, well that's really then maybe that's more. something you can write go. also in your book. I don't know. We're just launching ideas right. like what we said. <laughs> we gave you yeah. a good title. It's yours for the taking. Thank you for watching another episode of Thank A to the you. Show. If you have enjoyed A this episode half as much as we Subscribe, did. Subscribe. Subscribe, like, for you can follow Dr. Or not Dr. Oops. Right? <laughs> doctor. Your, your speech is so well. I felt like you are a doctor. Check you out, right? But no, That's you okay. can check out Elise. Thank you for who, taking the time. You can check out her stuff. We'll leave all those links in the description. Elise, if you have yes. anything you'd like to shout out to the world, now's your chance. Um, hi to my three daughters, Ava, Isa, Luna. There you go. Uh, shout out to them. Right. Uh, have a good day. Check out TED Talks for you. Seventy-five percent of people you. who watch this podcast aren't subscribed. Are not subscribed. Imagine what? that. Yeah. Imagine yeah, that's a lot. Imagine that. Actually, that's like yeah. We got to change those numbers. We got to. So what, what happens to those of our those... podcast? So what okay, subscribe, people? everybody. Please subscribe to or... this thoughtful show with these young men from two Thank parts you. of the world. Two parts, Thank two you. boys, 120, two boys. no, 150, two, actually. Two different, two different con continents, yes. There you go. Amazing. 200 podcasts. Subscribe or your link will take over your lives. Peace, love, <laughs> happiness. See ya. See ya. Believe in yourself. Uh, accept what you have. Um, maybe have a journal and write down every day what you are grateful for and always believe that God is great and mm -hmm. God has um, like he has the best for you kept for you you just have to work for it and if he has kept anything from you know that it's only for your benefit and it's because he's preparing you for something better amazing Fair. I wanna, well, before you wrap up well, do you want to share something that I've been doing this past year that's really made me really positive. I have this thing where mm -hmm. I have a reminder on my phone every three days I get saying, um, write some things you're grateful for. And I have this little notebook where I write down like three things.